right. Welcome everybody to Inside Quest. Our goal is to take you inside the minds of the world's most effective thinkers so that you can learn with ease what they have learned, oftentimes with great difficulty. And if you're paying attention, I promise you, our guests will help you acquire the behaviors and thought patterns, and that's the key that you're gonna need to be successful no matter what you're trying to accomplish in your own life. Okay, today's guest is a serial entrepreneur extraordinaire on a mission to prove that you can use business to improve people's lives, and oh my God, has he ever done that. But first, he had to lose at the amazing race by just minutes because he refused to ask for directions, a failure that cost him and his sister a million bucks and played out on national television, ouch. But don't worry, he quickly bounced back and his story took an insanely rad turn for the amazing when he went back to Argentina. There, he turned a chance encounter with some kids in need of shoes into arguably the most powerful social movement in all of commerce. 10 years later, he has built a socially conscious empire that has not only generated a jaw-dropping amount of revenue, but has introduced the world to the concept of one-for-one -one giving. Through his company, he has donated over 60 million pairs of shoes, restored sight to over 400,000 people, helped make more than 335,000 people uh, have safe drinking water and supplied safe birth services to over 25,000 women, all while building one of the fastest growing companies in his space and creating an untold number of jobs for people in the first and developing worlds. For his astounding achievements, he has been featured in numerous articles like How to Fix Capitalism by Bill Gates and People Magazine's Heroes Among Us. He's also been awarded many much-deserved accolades, including Fortune Magazine's 40 Under 40 Business Leaders and the Secretary of State's 2009 Award of Corporate Excellence. Please help me in welcoming the New York Times best-selling author of Start Something That Matters, the man Bill Clinton referred to as one of the most interesting entrepreneurs I have ever met, the founder and chief shoe giver of the game-changing Tom's Shoes, Blake McCoskey. Wow, you knew all my introductions? <laughs> that was incredible. It would be an honor, man. Wow. I, in fact, I will follow you around anytime you say I'm about to go in there and, and I'll blaze in. I'll wow. take care of business. It's awesome. But that was really, man, a lot of fun, a lot of fun to do that research. And I knew the story, but it's always the nuance that ends up being the most interesting stuff. And the thing that really stuck out to me is, is this concept of bouncing back. If you, I don't watch a lot of sports, but yeah. I remember some of those like crazy moments where the guy's running, he's about to get a 90 yard touchdown, he starts dancing, and then on the one yard line, someone knocks the ball out of his hand, and you think that guy is gonna cry for the rest of his life. Yeah. So to know that the tale of Tom's, which is truly a game-changing story and has inspired so many people, not the least of all is us here at Quest, that it started with a mistake, Yeah. right? Of not asking directions, <laughs> which is Such a, a male cliche, right? You know, my sister, who is my partner on The Amazing Race, we were, we were been racing for 30 days around the world. We've been to 13 countries. We were, you know, minutes away from winning a million dollars, which, you know, neither of us had a, a dollar in the bank at that point. So it was a just life-changing potential opportunity. And, and you know, it was, the last clue was to go find Pier 31, and we're in San Francisco, and I look at the water, and I think, well, a pier has to be on the water, so let's just run to the water. And my sister's like, I think it's going to be trickier than that, you know. Why don't we stop and, and ask some directions and get a map? And of course, on national television in front of 20 million people, I say, <laughs> I don't need a map. I know where I'm going, you know. So confident, uh, but yet so wrong. And then, you know, we got so lost and, and we lost the million dollars. And, uh, you know, it, it, at the time, it did feel like one of those, like, devastating, like, how could I have, you know, been so stupid mistakes? Um, but I would say shortly thereafter, within a couple months, you know, all of our memories were so amazing from that trip and from that show to go to so many countries we had never been to, to have experiences we never had. And, and the thing that I kind of made a pledge to myself after the show was over was I wanted to go back to these countries because when you're racing on the amazing race, like 
you really don't get to experience the culture. Mm. And so for me, I, you know, I started ticking them off. And, and, and when I went to Argentina, I really wanted to immerse myself into the culture because we had gone through there so quickly. Uh, and then that was the trip that led to the founding of Tom's. Yeah, it's, I love that so much because I think there's a lot of people that have a moment like what happened in The Amazing Race and they crumble. And your story to me seems defined by finding meaning in moments rather than just letting the moment pass. Is that something that you do on purpose? Like over that, that couple month period where you had to transition from feeling really rough mm -hmm. about the four minutes to no, this was actually an incredibly beautiful experience. What was that, what was going on in your mind in that time frame? I think the thing is, is that for whatever reason, I, I feel like I was almost built or, or born with like a special gratitude gene. <laughs> like wow. I think I've just always felt grateful um, for experiences, people, opportunities in my life, and I've had a lot of them. Um, and so what quickly happened, I think, after losing The Amazing Race was I, I kind of reimagined the experience not around losing the last four minutes, but 30 days of traveling the world with my sister, who is my best friend, and at the same time, getting to do it on national television with all my friends and family watching and right. being entertained. Um, and so the, the loss, we didn't go on the race to win a million dollars. We went on the race to have a great life experience mm. and we had that in spades. And so I was able to quickly reframe what happened as a really positive thing. And also it became the jumping off point for me to do a lot more global travel, which you know led my path uh, you know, to the place to where, you know, Tom started and so many other things amazing have happened in my life. Reframing is something that I find so, so useful. And um, when pressed, you know, like, oh, what are the ingredients for success? I've always said it's the people who can emotionally soothe themselves the fastest. And mm. what that process is for me is about reframing and putting something in a new context and looking at, it's like Tony Robbins would say, you change your life when you change your questions. Yes. And when you start asking, okay, how was the worst thing that ever happened to me, the best thing that ever happened, um, all of a sudden you, you start finding a different answer because of that different question. One of the most powerful things in your story is, there's, there's two things I wanna touch on. I'm gonna say them out loud so I make sure we don't forget. Um, one is that you started with nothing, and I think people assume that you um, had a, a lot sure. going for you, that you were flush with cash, yeah. you knew exactly what you were doing. I've been manufacturing yeah. 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 in yeah. You know, shoes for ages before sure. I started Tom's. So I wanna come back to that, because it's absolutely not true and, and really shows the power of your mindset. Um, and then the second one is that ability to um, really reframe things and to then take a, a step after rebounding and, and do something. So walk me through your, you go to Argentina, um, you see the kids, you, you decide, okay, I wanna help with this. Your plan is to give away 250 shoes and how does that become the juggernaut that it's become? Like what, what was the reframe that happened in all that that made you think of commerce? So I think it, you know, what was interesting about my trip to Argentina was I met a couple of women at this cafe and we were talking about what they were doing in Argentina and, and I was there on, on vacation and, and they were talking about doing this shoe drive and helping children get shoes who needed them to go to school. And I thought it was a really cool idea. I had never really uh, had any direct experience with philanthropy in that way before or charity in that way. My family you know, gave money to the local church or to different groups, you know, but it was never like a part of our, our ethos. It was just yeah. something they did kind of here and there. And so when the women invited me to go help distribute the shoes, it was like, I, I, once again, I love new experiences. So it wasn't so much it came from like, oh, I feel this deep passion to help these kids. It was like, oh, this will be something I've never done before. Right. So, but when I got there and I saw just this incredible joy and like, you know, and just in just, you know, I'm like spastic energy that was coming from the kids and their parents when they were getting these shoes. And they weren't even new shoes. These were these were hand me downs that they got from other families in Buenos Aires. I I immediately like was was drawn to that energy mm. and drawn to that joy that was being exchanged between a person giving and a person receiving. Right. And and so when I left that day, I really wanted to continue to have that be in my life. Mm. 
at the time I was taking some polo lessons in Argentina because everyone plays polo there and I was talking to my instructor that night at dinner at Lejo um, and I explained to him what was going on and that I was wanting to help more and, and he asked a question actually that really kind of I think was the catalyst to turning the Tom's idea into a business and to what it became is he said you know what's going to happen when the kids wear out of their shoes? Mm -hmm. Like, is there another don donation coming? Like, how do they know for sure? Because giving kids shoes once to go to school is is not really that good. It actually is going to harm them more if there's not another pair because they're going to get so excited and they're going to be let down. And so that question is what led to me thinking the next day about a more sustainable solution than charity. I think charity is super important and my wife and I have the privilege of doing a lot of charity and philanthropy now, but it, in this specific situation, kids needing shoes, it did not seem to be the right answer because it was so dependent on donations that weren't certain. And so the next day when I woke up and I was writing in my journal and thinking about all this, I was an entrepreneur already. I would started four other companies and had learned a lot about using business to solve problems um, for profit. I mean, that was how kind of the entrepreneurial landscape was. And so this is the first time I thought, well, could you actually use a business to solve a social problem? Right. You know, could it be something that's not just a problem that a customer has, they can't get the right, you know, you know, food that they want or they can't get the right movies that they want or whatever it is, but no, this is actually a, a, a social issue that children need shoes, in this case in Argentina, could I create a business that would solve that and actually sustain itself so I don't have to ask people for donations or charity? And, and that's how the idea of Tom's and One for One came was thinking, okay, there's these really great shoes in Argentina that we don't currently have in the United States. What if I make these shoes and sell them in the U.S. and then give them to kids in Argentina and you buy a pair, we give a pair one for one. And and it was just a, like you said, it was an idea that we, there were 250 kids in that village and that was the idea to help those 250 kids. My goal was to sell the shoes that summer and then come back at Christmas time and give the shoes to the kids because that's when they would need another pair. And, uh, and you know, the God, I believe, and the universe had a different plan for me and that was to help millions of children. And, and that started just with some very simple um, you know, people wearing the shoes and talking about it and media talking about it. And then it was also the explosion of social media. You know, 2006 is when Facebook came um, offline. Uh, YouTube was started the same year. So I, I do believe that that, uh, that change in the way that media was consumed at the exact time that I had a really interesting story to tell the world allowed us to spread so rapidly. Yeah, and the storytelling is something super powerful and, and one thing that I think will be useful for people to hear is going back to that notion of um, what passion really looks like, how it feels in your life, and when you know you should act on it. So you, uh, the, the great irony of Tom's for me is that you were taking a break from another company you'd started, yeah. which was very successful, had yeah. just launched, was, you know, I'm sure at that point about to fill all of your financial goals oh, and dreams. Sure. And instead of doing that, you tell your partners, hey, buy me out. Yeah. And I'm going to go struggle and build something that <laughs> is from the ground up yeah. with virtually nothing. Why did you do that? What were you trying to capture? What were you trying to accomplish? So I started my first company when I was 19. It was a laundry business. Um, and then from there, I got into media. And the company that you're referring to is an online education company that was from the moment we started just a rocket ship in growth. And, and I'd had some success and I'd had some failures, um, but I think after being an entrepreneur for at that point about 10 years, I just felt that there, that there was something more meaningful I could be doing than just starting a business to capitalize on an opportunity. And even though the online education company was, I feel like providing an important service, uh, it didn't, I didn't feel the, the connection, or you could say the passion for it. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was, you know, I was doing what I had learned to do, and that is see an opportunity, build a product, launch the product, profit from it, you know, and then, and then kind of it iterate. So when I saw these kids that needed shoes, and I saw that I had a, a, a really, what I felt like was a, a really clever way of providing them with shoes and kind of potentially building a business, um, it just seemed like the right thing to do from a passion perspective, from a fun perspective. I mean, a lot of people focus on 
the the giving or the philanthropy of Tom's and that being a motivating factor. But truthfully, it was just, I knew this was going to be a ton of fun. Mm. I mean, the fact that I'd get to go back and forth to Argentina, I'd started to make friends there. The fact that I'd get to visit, visit these villages and spend time with these kids. The fact that I'd get to learn something totally new, like how to sell shoes and design shoes and something I'd never done. Like, I didn't have any idea that it would get to be a really successful business or even become what it's become, but I knew I'd have fun doing it. And I think I'd gotten a little bit into the, the almost like a, uh, a monotonous rut of entrepreneurship. Like once you've started and sold a company, it's like you kind of see a formula of how you can do it. And, yeah. and even if you're good at it, doesn't mean that you're passionate about it. And so thankfully I turned away from something that I could have done in a very mechanical way and made a lot of money doing for something I was passionate about, but then my passion quickly required all the knowledge that I learned in starting these other businesses, and so I was able to combine the two, and I think that's why we've had the success, is because it was the perfect match between what my heart and soul wanted to be doing and what my brain knew how to do. Mm. Yeah, and I love that because I think right now there's somebody out there that has an equally powerful idea For sure. that's afraid to start it because um, the imposter syndrome, we'll call it. It's not always fear. And I yeah. think that fear is huge. Fear is a major thing that holds people back. But one of the things I think that they're most afraid of is um, like right now, at this very moment, I am terrified that everyone in this audience will realize that I'm just a 13-year-old kid who has no idea what he's doing, right? Yeah. Like, and that, that exists inside me at all sure. times. And I'm always looking over my shoulder like, is anyone going to try to come take the keys? Like, yeah. <laughs> at what point do they figure this out? Um, and so to hear a story that ends so profoundly starting in an apartment yep. where you didn't know how to make shoes, um, the famous phone call where the person's like, I need to order shoes right yeah. now. Yeah. And you're like, I, I can't help you. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it debunks some of the myths that you have to have it all buttoned up and together before you even try. Sure. Is that something that people ask you about? Like, I'd say one of the things I'm most passionate about sharing, especially when I speak to universities um, and people kind of in, you know, at the beginning of their careers and thinking about what they want to do, I think that what happens is, is um, a lot of people get paralyzed by the complexity of what their idea could become. Mm. You know, they think instead of instead of thinking about helping 250 kids and making shoes in, in garages in Argentina, which isn't like a huge complex supply chain and isn't a big sales force or anything, mm -hmm. you know, they start thinking about what a big shoe company looks like. And they don't even start because they're like, there's no way I could start a big shoe company. I don't have the money. I don't have the expertise. And so I think now one of the things, and I'm glad you asked this question, that is, is really important for me to share with people is is that I didn't have any financial backing. I mean, literally the whole company was started with less than $5,000. I had $5,000 that I invested in samples and travel and, 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 and basically going back and forth to Argentina. That was it. And from that, we sold those shoes and then we used the cash flow for those shoes to buy more shoes. And then we literally funded the whole business with the cash flow of those initial sales compounded over time. And and the other thing is, is I never sold shoes, never designed shoes. And I think that, that kind of beginner's mind gave us a huge competitive advantage in the footwear business because we, did, we didn't know the rules, so we broke so many of them. <laughs> um, and so when people are thinking about starting something and maybe what holds them back, whether it's fear or it's I'm going to be an imposter or I don't have the resources, I always say like really focus on starting really small. Because if you can prove that something can work on a very small miniature level, which usually involves very little risk, sometimes doing it as a moonlighting project, even keeping your existing job if you have one, if you can prove it works at a small level, then you have the opportunity to potentially scale it. But if you work on raising all this money and writing these big business plans and doing all this stuff, it's actually you, you, you decrease your chances of success, I believe, because then it becomes such a big project from day one that you don't get to, to kind of get into it and learn through it in those early stages. And so those days in the apartment when we're literally selling the shoes one at a time, those are the formidable moments that helped us learn what our customers wanted, what, what we needed to improve on, so that when we did start getting into the big department stores and whatnot, we had uh, already worked out a lot of the kinks. And so that, I think, by focusing on starting small, 
removes a lot of the obstacles to getting started. But the number one thing you need to think about if you're going to start a company is find your story. Yes. So this is something I get asked about a lot, which yeah. is at, put another way, like, you know, find your passion. What's the thing that you're yeah. really passionate about? And, and I don't think people come out of the womb with a passion. I think that it's a confluence of events that usually go something like this. I'm interested in this thing. I start doing this thing. I start getting better at it. The gaining of the mastery yep. really ignites a passion in me, and then it becomes something full blown. How do you help people find their story in order to really put a meaningful business around it? I think the word find your story is tough because I feel like if you have life experiences that somehow lead you to believing you want to start a business, um, then I think your story is a natural byproduct of that. You know, one of the things that I also speak a lot about with students is I don't think you choose to be an entrepreneur like you choose to be a doctor or a lawyer or a banker. You know, those are professions that you study for, you make a conscious decision, then you typically get a starter job or an internship, and then you learn a trade, and then you become that. Mm. I think when you, if you, I think with entrepreneurship, what happens is, is in your life, you have an experience. It either have a, a product that you wish existed that didn't exist, you are disappointed with a service that you experience and you want it to be better. Uh, there's something that happens in your life that causes you to say, I could do that better. Mm. And then if you're passionate enough about doing it better, that becomes a business and then you become an entrepreneur versus graduating school and saying, hey, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. What am I going to do? Like, because those that path, I think, is very risky because then you're just looking for something to capitalize on mm. versus being driven to change something or invent something or bring something into the world that you want and that you believe other people will want to. When I look at the most successful companies of all time or even just the brands that we all love and support, almost all of them come with someone who wanted something different, wanting, wasn't happy about something or something like that. And then to your question about the story, the story is that person's experience. You know, I, you know, I, I wanted to, um, you know, have this and it didn't exist. So I created that. That happens all the time in entrepreneurship. Yeah, for sure. And what do you think uh, about resiliency, which is something that I see in your story a lot? For instance, the uh, you're building the online education course. You're burnt out because you guys had to run so hard to get yep. it live go to Argentina, um, that becomes sort of this cathartic moment where you find something new that you're more interested in, you've got the energy again, you wanna push it forward. And then that happens again in your life in Tom's, I think around year six, you, yeah. you've been pushing this thing, building it so hard, so fast, um, and, and you go back and start asking yourself some why questions. What did that process look like? Um, is, is that sort of introspection something that you do very intentionally at given intervals, or how did that come about? I think that the resilience to keep going is, is what I have learned and learned through the Tom's experience is it's just so important to take time to recharge. And when you're going so hard, even if you're so passionate about something and you believe that you're you know, doing something for a higher purpose, you're still at some point going to get burnt out or exhausted. And when you do, uh, then it, 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 it just, just takes away some of the motivation and, and the fun aspect or and when that happens um, you know then everything kind of starts to shut down what I'm trying to do now is take time off more frequently so that I don't get to the burnout phase so instead of having this phase where I'm so burnt out that then I want to completely check out like I did in 2012 at Tom's and then after checking out for a while then I feel guilty so then I come back <laughs> and burn myself out again right. instead of that vicious cycle that I have done many times in my life especially in business what I'm trying to do is it, it, it at, at much shorter intervals just get some time to have a little bit more balance so I don't get to that burnout phase. What do you use to judge okay now I'm in the danger zone now I need to make that change before it's too late I think the judge is really just energy level, you know, like when I am, when I, for consecutive days in a row or a week or two in a row am feeling just run down 
or like I'm having to drink a lot of coffee to like, you know, to like to, to, to get up in the morning or, or, or throughout the day or, you know, finding myself drinking alcohol more in the evening because I'm stressed. I start noticing unhealthy patterns right. in how I'm treating my body. And then that's usually the best test for, okay, you need to, you need to take a, a couple of days off and, and really spend time with the family and just, you know, just unplug for a little bit. And in the way that I do that is really in nature. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time, you know, hiking and climbing and fly fishing and just being out in nature. And that really helps me mentally reset. And when you're doing that, so you're out in nature, it puts you in a certain brainwave state, I'm sure. Is it active introspection? Is it staying still and quiet so that you can hear the voice? Is it an active pursuit or what does that look like? So it's interesting. I think for everyone it's different. For me, it is actually doing another, doing a, a, usually a physical activity or something in nature, but completely immersed in that. So I, if, I, I, if I was saying feeling a little bit burnt out or tired, going and sitting on a beach would be the worst thing for me because all I would do is think about the issues <laughs> back at work. So fly fishing is great because it takes a lot of concentration to try to catch a fish on this little fly in the river. It's funny because my wife always says, like, you go on vacation, we go because you're exhausted from work, but all you do is activity and you just get more tired. And I'm like, no, maybe physically I get tired, but it's good for me. Mm -hmm. But it, it removes the, all the other stuff going on in my mind because I can't focus on two things at once. So I find that sometimes for me, climbing or doing an activity almost is a form of meditation because I'm solely focused on that. So there's no other thoughts coming into my mind. Um, now, I do think there are times when it is nice to take times throughout the day to have short meditations or to have times for that introspection. And I do a lot of that with my journaling. I journal a lot. Um, but for me, if I really need to recharge, it's actually for me to focus my energy on something that's activity-based. So when you do then the active introspection, it seems like you have uh, certain precepts in your mind um, that you're bouncing ideas off of, for lack of a better word, but you, um, you've you come out each one of these ones, at least the ones that you talk about publicly, you've come out the other side as as having evolved. Yes. So by what are we judging the direction that we want to take the evolution? Like I'm trying to find those things that I can use in my own life yeah. or that you know other people can implement. I think the biggest thing for me is the practice of journaling because in journaling I am, able to not only kind of record the things that I'm challenged with or the things that I am happy with, but then I'm able to kind of go back months later or even years later and, and learn from those experiences. I think we can learn a certain amount from the experience itself in real time, but sometimes the greatest teacher is ourself, but giving it some time. And so, and so by writing out the things that I'm struggling with or the things that I'm excited about or the challenges I'm trying to, to figure out, it, it helps me kind of internalize it more at the moment, but then when I go back and I read it, it helps me give it per, more perspective. And so I think that a lot of the things that I've learned in business and through Tom specifically have come from me being great at documenting the things that we're going through and then being able to revisit those things to see how what once was a challenge became an opportunity and vice versa. Mm. And so through that process, how do you think about identity and evolving your identity and, and really making something a part of how you think of yourself? Well, I think that, you know, as, as entrepreneurs, often happens I think is your company or your product or whatever becomes such a huge part of your identity mm. um, and I think that can be positive but I also think that can be limiting if you're talking about kind of an evolutionary state and I hope that my legacy is not just Tom's like I love Tom's and I'm really thankful that I've created it and that I love all the people that work there but but I feel like I'm limiting my future potential if I stay just with that identity. I mean, I want to be known as a great father. You know, I want to be known as a great friend. Um, and, and these are the things that I think give, the, um, give life the, the greatest meaning. Um, and, and so identity is something that can be really powerful. 
Um, and it is something that, uh, especially within business or creating something, it's, it's a real blessing to have a, such a strong identity tied to your business. But you have to be careful that it doesn't um, overwhelm or, or kind of overshadow the other parts of your identity too because then I don't think you're experiencing the fullness that life has to offer. So how do you stop that from becoming um, dogmatic, from being a trap? How do you keep yourself open and fresh to, like even sitting from my perspective, yeah. the thought of you transcending Tom's, and not to get away from it obviously, but to, to open up a legacy that has more possibilities, um, it doesn't seem easy because you're so you're so associated with the brand. Yeah. People assume your name is Tom. Sure, yeah, exactly. Right. So, yeah. at uh, like, what does that process look like for you internally? Is there something you do to stay open-minded? Well, I think it's it's a lot about is um, it's about where you place your time. Like, if you really look at people uh, people's priorities and and you really want to know what someone's about, uh, just look at their schedule. <laughs> You know, I mean, that really is it. And I've learned that actually by being married and now having a, a son is someone can say that they, uh, you know, care about all these different things in their life, but if they're not on their schedule, then <laughs> how much do they, how much yeah. importance are they placing on it? And so the way that I allow my identity and, and, how, and have created, I think, an identity that's beyond Tom's, at least for the people that know me personally, mm. um, is by making sure that I am dedicating the time to the things that I say are the most important. And it's not always going to be equal proportion because, you know, Monday through Friday, you have to spend a lot of time at work. I mean, it's just the reality of providing for your family and, mm. and life. But making sure that the other times when you have the free time, that you're making sure you're investing it purposefully, I think is a good um, recipe for for having a more balanced identity. Yeah, that's a, a really useful metric to look at. Like, okay, here's what I'm saying is important. It's frightening and too. <laughs> it's useful and it's, it's just like it just I mean, cuts through all the BS, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, you just can't you can't argue with the schedule. Yeah, <laughs> that's really useful. I'm gonna have to start tracking that. And you know, coming from the, I used to be 60 pounds heavier. So for me, coming to get my body where I wanted it, I, I really had to pay attention to my workouts, what I was eating, like all of that stuff was regimented, documented, journaled, all that. Um, and then when you think about time, I don't have the same care with my time that I do, uh, that I did with, with all of that. It's pretty fascinating. It, it really is. I mean, when you really start looking at it and, and, if, you t and if you've taken that same approach to nutrition, then you can understand what it would feel like or look like to time. Um, and, it, and it really can be pretty transformational and it can also be very enlightening because you'll find that there's a lot of stuff you're investing a lot of time in that you really don't place that much value on. Yeah. Yes. I'm sure that is absolutely <laughs> true. This is going to be a startling revelation, I fear. Um, so I encountered an idea called ideas in equal ideas out. Okay. Um, and going back to this notion of staying nimble, keeping your idea or your identity supple so that you're always open to going in, in new directions. For me, the most powerful ally I have in that is just encountering new ideas, which I do through books. Yeah. Um, what techniques do you have for encountering the new ideas? Travel obviously seems like one. Anything Ted beyond? Talks. I think TED Talks or any type of, you know, kind of short, you know, easily uh, um, kind of digestible talks are really mm. good. Uh, that's been something I've done. Um, but I think you're right. I think that, like, if you proactively seek out different ways of thinking and ideas in digestible uh, uh, content that, that you can get quickly, I think that helps you know, kind of keep the mind nimble and, and, and open to, you know, all different types of thinking. You also have a, another technique that I'm seeing in just the way you're expanding your business, which I find really interesting to go back to what you said about keeping the beginner's mind. Yeah. Um, and that's something definitely that served us well here. We had no idea what we were getting into yeah. from a manufacturing perspective. Sure. And if we had, yeah. uh, I don't know that we would have had the courage to do it, but not knowing what we were getting into actually ended up being powerful very much like what you were saying. Looking at where you're taking your company is fascinating. It's, it's totally new, weird areas. It's coffee. It's yep. uh, the birthing bags. Yep. It's um, culturally as a company, is that something that you celebrate to, to make sure that it is new and outside the ordinary or... I think that 
You know, we've taken a very non-traditional approach to the um, to the way that we've expanded our product lines, and largely it's been driven by the thing that makes our business the most different, and that is the giving. Mm. So instead of starting with thinking like, okay, let's create a product, and then what are we going to give? We start with what is a need that we see in the world, and then how can we create a product to serve that need? One thing that I really responded is to in your story and, and really digging into you is that you're really authentically looking at how we can help and the story of how you sold one business, which at least in the beginning was certain to make you more money, but the other one was way more fulfilling and help people. Um, but going down the line further, even though there's something so beautiful, there's... Um, there's a, a desire to win. So as I was researching, sure. the, the concept that kept coming into my head was beautiful competition, mm -hmm. right? And normally competition, can, can, it can uplift or it can um, actually be problematic. Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting to me the way that you guys have done this beautiful competition. How do you stay competitive, hungry, push, drive to grow? You've grown so fast and I know how hard that is. Yeah. How do you do that and not lose sight of the beautiful thing that you're doing for people. Well, I think that that's one thing that people um, people are surprised when they come to the first day of work at Tom's. We're a really competitive group of people. <laughs> like they kind of think it's going to be like kumbaya and this like beautiful, <laughs> you know, we're helping the world. And yes, yes, we are really uh, proud of the work that we do, and we take our giving very seriously. Um, but we're also uh, we like to win, and because winning to us is seeing more positive impact in the world. They're, they're exactly correlated. The growth of our business is the number of people that we help. And that's what's so beautiful, I think, about one for one, is like there is no um, trade-offs. You know, you know, more growth equals more people being helped. And so in order to grow more and to get more market share from a competitor, you have to work hard at it. You have to be creative, you have to be resourceful, you have to have the right people. You have to, you know, you have to go the extra mile with customers and support. But we don't look at competition as us winning and someone losing. I think that's really important to look at, is we look at when we win, a lot of people win. Our factory workers win, the people that are getting the shoes win, the kids that are getting eye surgeries win. So there's a lot bigger motivation in winning for winning's sake. Right. Yeah, that, that really makes a lot of sense. And finding that balance, I find, especially in the hiring process, can be very difficult. You know, if you've got two people and, and they're equal in competitiveness and uh, compassion, okay, that's yep. nice and easy. But when you start getting an imbalance, like let's say you have someone who's deeply compassionate, but they're, they just have no spark, no fire. Mm. They really want to help. That makes them feel yeah. good. But like, how hard am I really willing to work yeah. to make it happen? Or vice versa. It's like, yes, the, the better the company does, the more people get help. But this person is not thinking about that yeah. one iota. They've got a number they're trying to hit. They're trying to crush. They're trying to yeah. you know beat against other people. So finding something that, that keeps the culture alive in the company, I imagine, has got to be... Uh, a it's bitch. an art. It's definitely not a science. I mean, that's what I've learned through the years is like you can't... And that's why you have to have multiple interviews. You know, we do a lot of kind of psychological testing on 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 certain level of hires and up. Tell me more. <laughs> so, what, what does that psychological yeah. testing look like? So we, we use a, a test called the Berkman, and the Berkman uh, was developed years ago to really help understand what causes people's stress behaviors. Mm -hmm. And so it's the craziest test. Like it's like a thirty minute test, and it will ask you all these questions. Like if you could be either a fireman, a music teacher, or, I don't know, a priest, what would you be? It's all these scenario type questions they ask that seem to mean nothing. But then what it produces is this incredible report that literally feels like someone has opened up your heart and your brain and put it oh. on the table. And so what's great about that is, is it doesn't tell us whether someone's good or bad or someone's the right, has the right skill set or not. It says, if this 
if this environment is happening, this person's going to have stress and they're not going to do as well in this environment. So if, if, if you know that the job is going to require, say, a lot of travel, right. and in their Berkman says a lot of travel requires, gives them a lot of stress, no matter what they say in the interview, this is not a good person to hire for that role. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. So we're implementing um, something in our hiring process now. I forget the name of the test, but what you're doing is showing people a bunch of eyes, okay. just the eyes, in a moment of a of expression, so it's not neutral. It's happy, it's sad, it's fearful, yeah. it's rage, whatever. Um, and then their ability to accurately correlate those shows a degree of empathy, right? Yeah, An sure. ability to put yourself in, in their shoes, which I find is maybe the most compelling human trait is the ability to see life from their perspective, yeah. especially if you're trying to see yourself through their eyes to understand like how your leadership style is working or whatever, um, but certainly to know how they'll function in a, in a given situation. It's, yeah. it's pretty compelling. And if people aren't able to do that, if they can't accurately judge, um, then it, leadership will be very, very difficult for them because they won't ever be able to understand or anticipate what the people they're leading are going through. You know, Matt's actually something I wanted to ask you about. Do you consider yourself to be um, very self-aware? I would say I've been getting better every day. I mean, I don't, I, I think it's hard. It, self-awareness is something I think that is a lifelong pursuit, not something that you're born with. Maybe some people are indexing higher in self-awareness just naturally, but it's definitely something that, if I look at myself 10 years ago when I started Tom's and I look at myself today, I'd say I'm a lot more self-aware today than I was 10 years ago. What'd you do to develop it? That's such a powerful skill. I think life experience. I mean, I think really, you know, experience, um, learning from your mistakes. I think journaling, once again, is a really great technique for gaining more self-awareness because when you write something down and then you go back and read it, mm. it's almost like watching a movie right. that you're in. Wow, that's really interesting. And I've nah, I used to journal. Yeah. Um, when I was younger, when okay. I was focused on film, I did that a lot because it was a way just to generate mm -hmm. ideas to get the flow. Um, but since I've been in business, I haven't focused on it at all. But you make a pretty compelling case for um, growing self-awareness. And I'm sure some of this is revealed in my questions. But one thing I'm always looking for are what, like, people that have accomplished exceptional things, I have a baseline belief that they have simply done better things. So uh, that sounds totally void of meaning, so I'll say it like this. People who are good at tennis have practiced more. Yes. They've taken more swings. They've yep. recognized the weakness in yep. their form. 10, they practice their serve. Yep. Exactly, and not just the hours, but the ability to recognize good coaching, what sure. is what needs to be addressed, how to address it, because 10,000 hours of bad practice, to a better practice takes you nowhere. Yeah, um, sounds like my golf swing. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so um, finding a way to, to really look at people that have achieved on your level and begin to understand some of the things that you, you seem very, very exceptional at. And I appreciate the humility and I respect it, but from my perspective, you seem incredibly self-aware. And as I was going through the research and, and I was, I have the, the great fortune of when you're looking at someone's life in a very condensed period of time, I can watch all of the interviews that you've done over you know 10 years. Yeah. And I can hear in the span of a couple of days how your mind is evolving. Changing, yeah. So it's like, okay, I, I actually, oh, he made a big change here. There was some breakthrough that he yeah. had here, something, and you can see some of them come from like a, not necessarily a painful place, but like when you, you said you took nine months off and the first four months were incredibly powerful and then the last five months you started to feel guilty and you were just totally wasting your time. Yeah. Uh, and, but to, to see how you reflect back on all of that stuff is, is, was very useful for me uh, because I was getting all the insights that you were getting, but you know, down into this condensed thing. And I don't know, just going through it all, you can see, no, 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 this, some, this is somebody who isn't um, mindlessly fly fishing, but you're, you're doing the things you need to do to have these really key insights. It's super profound. Um, there's, this is all building towards one key insight that I know you have for people watching and listening, which is um, people come up to you fresh out of school and they say, should I take this job or this one that pays a little bit more? Yeah. And you have some incredibly good advice for them. I, I definitely am passionate about this question because um, I, I always say to students or someone who's in their early in their career, the, the biggest mistake you can make is taking a job for the money. 
And the reason is, and I think, you know, we could literally, if we had a chalkboard, I could, I could with math, show you why this is, is true, is no matter what job you take, let's say in your 20s, the difference in delta between the job that would pay you the most and pay you the least is actually not that much money in this span of your life, right? And, and what's proven is you're going to spend the money, whether you make 50000 a year or 80000 a year, you're going to spend it. So, so the most important thing you can do in the early stages of your career is to gain experience and be in a job that you're learning and inspired and you're growing. Because the skills that you develop there is what's going to create a higher income in your 30s, 40s, and 50s. Even if they have to have four roommates or whatever, like if they're learning something and growing, they're actually earning more than they realize sure. than just the money that they're making. So I think that unfortunately, and I think it's a little better now since kind of the financial collapse and everything that's kind of happened is, 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 is the idea of earning um, is not about what's on your paycheck, but what experiences you're gaining. Because the experience is what ultimately someone's going to pay you for later in your career, where you can generate enough income to have retirement and savings and get to do some of the things you want to do in your life. So um, that's something that I've, I've seen young people make mistake time again, and I'm really passionate against. Yeah. Oh, man, that's so poignant to me and is so right on the money. And another thing that you've added uh, before when you've touched on the subject is you've got this window where you're going to be developing your identity and taking the knowledge that you're gaining to combine it into that identity, which will ultimately become your story and the thing that you're going to be passionate about and will give you the fire to fight for um, whatever that thing is. It's, it's such a formative period. Um, it's, it's definitely easier with young people fresh out of college because you're in this weird period where poverty is really okay and nobody's <laughs> judging you for that. Yeah. Uh, and you probably don't have a spouse and kids that it's are counting sure. on you. Yeah. Um, but man, I'll say for anybody who's willing to, to accept the truth of the matter, which is people pay for the knowledge. They pay for the experience. They pay for those things that you're going to glean from doing all of that work. And I think that people have a natural progression that they expect in their head of, I'm going to have this job and that gets promoted to this and, you know, career paths, right? Yeah. And um, a career path to, to somebody who's entrepreneurial, I certainly will put myself in that category and I assume you do as well. Um, the career path kind of goes out the window. It's like there's a problem to be solved and how am I going to solve that problem in service of some need or, you know, desire that I have to make something come true. And people stop themselves themselves because oh well that will be a step back for me oh that pays less money or yeah. oh it's a worse title like yeah who cares if it's going to give you the step that you need on the path to what you really want to accomplish then do or it's it. even going to give you I mean the step or I always say it's also it's about the people you get to work with yeah you know like I would I would if it, you know if I was embarking on a new venture um I would probably do a lot of things that I maybe don't do now at Tom's because we have this big organization supporting the organization that I would do if it allowed me to work along a person that I would learn from. So I think that's a really important thing to look at at all ages and in all stages in careers is, you know, it's not about the title or the this or that. It's about who you actually working with every day and is that person or people inspiring you, growing you, it ever because if you're not growing you're not inspired you're you're not you're not you're not moving forward all right one last question sure what's your definition of a life well lived a life well lived man uh that's a big question that's why i saved it for the end <laughs> um <laughs> you know there's a great quote um uh, by chateaubriand and i can't do, do the whole quote justice but it basically says that the master of living does not personally dis make a distinction between his work and his play but instead uh, you know lets other people decide you know what they're doing but to himself uh, he's always doing both and I think you know that is to me the definition of of kind of living uh, a life well lived with grace is that you're not making these sharp distinctions between 
you know, work and play or work and leisure. You're kind of experiencing life in the in the in the all the different facets at once, and you're letting them weave together instead of trying to compartmentalize them. And that's not easy to do. Um, but I find that for me, when I feel like I'm kind of living the most meaningful life. I'm just as easily talking to you here as FaceTiming with my son on the, you know, in the green room afterwards, as doing a conference call with the board, as going rock climbing with my buddy this afternoon. You know, like it's 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 kind of not trying so hard to keep things separate, but allowing it all to work together. And when I feel like that's happening. I feel like my life is flowing, and then I think over the length of my life, I would look back and say, "Gosh, I really kind of did it all,、um, and it all kind of worked together." That's an awesome answer, man. Great. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Incredible. Incredible. Thank you. All right. Where, where, or where can they find you? Uh, probably the best is Tom's dot com.、Um, I'm on uh, uh, Twitter at, at Blake Mikoski and Instagram. We、um, are launching a new thing called the Tomorrow's Project on Tom's, which is going to be a lot more of content related to social entrepreneurship, our investment fund, and how we can encourage more people to start businesses that are giving back. Fantastic! Great. All right, guys. I encourage you to go and check him out. Tom's stands for Tomorrow's Shoes. You just heard what he's talking about with the fund. This is somebody that is all about making tomorrow a better place. Of really investing, not only in the future of commerce and their own business, but the future of themselves. And as you learn more about this guy, you're going to see he is absolutely astonishing. At evolving himself and pushing that evolution, and not being afraid to ask himself every day, "Is this what I want to be doing with my life?" And when it is, he does more of it. And when it's not, he makes a change. And it is those moments of change when you look at his life on a timeline that are utterly astonishing. And at each point, I promise you, you're going to learn something about yourself, and you're going to begin to reflect on yourself. And that ability to generate. Self-awareness and to get better at it, and to acquire those skills that you need to grow and learn.、Uh, he is an exemplar at that. And when you talk about passion, and when you talk about a life of meaning, I honestly don't know if there is a name more synonymous than this man. So dig in and apply it to your life. We do this every week. We bring you the world's most incredible people, and we give them a forum to hopefully give you the things that you need to think in a new way, to act in a new way, and to accomplish something brand new in your life. So don't miss an episode. Be sure to subscribe. And until next week, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome.